Welcome to Wayne County Connections. I'm your host, Michael Swigert. It's a pleasure to have you join us as we talk about individuals and agencies that make Wayne County a great place to work, live, and play. As always, we encourage you to visit our website, waynenet.org slash cc, for additional information about this month's guests, previous guests, and other things that are going on in Wayne County. For today's show, we have a couple of guests. Our first guest is Fred Griffin. He's the director of the Wayne County Emergency Management Association. And later, we'll be talking with Scott Gregory, who is the chief of the Perry Township Volunteer Fire Department. Be sure to stay tuned for that segment of our show. For right now, I'd like to get our show started here today with Fred Griffin, executive director, as I said, of the Wayne County Emergency Management Association. You've been in that position for several years and, and a return guest to our show. Welcome back. Well, thank you. Good to be here. Thanks. I'd like to, uh, just for our guests who may not know or may not have seen our previous show, for you to give a little bit of background about yourself and how you got involved with the Emergency Management Association. I've been with Wayne County Government and Emergency Management Agency since uh, 1988, so getting to be an old timer in the, in the <laughs> position. Long beard, I guess. Probably know what you're doing by now. Uh, it, with the way the business changes, yeah, we're, we're, it's, a, it's a struggle to keep up some days. Um, seen a lot, done a lot, hopefully some good for the community. Mm -hmm. Um, I got involved with it because there was an application, a uh, job opening, and I needed a job, put in an application, and, and got hired. Okay. And things have changed in emergency management over the years. As we talked last time, it was the big event in 2001 that kind of really shifted the focus, uh, the way the, the agencies that you deal with and, and so forth, and, but really just expanded what you were already doing. I exactly. Uh, when I first got involved in 1988, the big focus was on hazardous materials, uh, developed of, uh, development of response plans, and, and uh, at that time rollout of the uh, Community Right to Know Act, which uh, allows us to collect information from facilities that have haz hazmat on site, as well as uh, transport it through our community. So a lot of planning effort, a lot of training and, and uh, focus on, on just that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Um, we we were also transitioning to an all hazards approach, more more uh, away from the civil defense focus on nuclear attack, mm -hmm. to an all hazards provision, uh, looking at everything that might happen to a jurisdiction besides nuclear attack, mm -hmm. and also looking at how those plans could be integrated. Some of those plans that were in existence for nuclear attack, how those could be um, rolled into tornadoes, earthquakes, and and other things. So, yeah, the focus definitely shifted after uh, September 11th of uh, 2001 uh, to terrorism, uh, counterterrorism response, information management, uh, collaboration, uh, not only with other emergency agencies, but with communities mm -hmm. and getting everyone involved because it takes all of us to be effective. Mm -hmm. It does take a, a community to save a community. It does. It, it does. It does. As it were. Um, but we talk about the, those big events and sometimes those huge things like nuclear disaster or terrorism, they seem so far away, but emergency management also deals with other things that we deal with on a regular basis like snow events and weather Flooding, and winter so storms, wind storms, uh, the complete gamut of what effects, what, what bad effects our jurisdiction can, can become involved with. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to have enough time during our show today to hit all of the ways that emergency management agency affects residents. So where can they get more information if they're interested? Always uh, give us a call. 973-9399 is our office number. Uh, we do have a web page on the county website. So co.wayne.in.us. Uh, look for Wayne County Emergency Management Agency. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also responsible now for management of the 911 center. So there's additional information on our 911 web page. Okay. What does it mean when we talk about preparedness, as, as we encourage our viewers to contact you again, but what does it mean to be prepared, and, and why is that important? Uh, you know, it, emergency preparedness, you know, we've got these agencies, we've got you heading up the emergency management agency and all of these other agencies and fire departments, police departments, homeland security. Um, shouldn't that stuff just be left to professionals? Why, why should the individual be worried about that? The individual is part of the team. Uh, the individual is probably the most important part of the team. Uh, by individuals and families taking, a, taking some time to be prepared to understand the threats that they face in a, in a community, in their specific uh, housing location, uh, taking some time to prepare by uh, putting a little plan together, uh, how to get a hold of, of uh, individual family members 
throughout the day uh, as they travel from work or school or, or, or even on vacation or places of entertainment, uh, being able to get, reach out and get in touch with them, knowing uh, those kinds of things and then having some basic emergency supplies. Uh, by thinking through these things in advance, we never know when a disaster is going to occur. So right. when the disaster does occur, you're a step ahead of those who haven't taken that, that planning step. Uh, that allows you to react quicker, uh, allows you to react more effectively, protect yourself and your family to a greater extent. And then depending on, on your particular situation, um, it may allow you to be a little more comfortable <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, than some of the others who haven't. Um, Yes, it's important for us as emergency service providers, the fire departments, the police departments, emergency management, and other professionals out there to be prepared to respond and take effective action. Uh, but if the community itself hasn't taken some steps, um, there, there's a limited number of us to go around. Mm -hmm. And it may take a few days for us to get to everybody's needs. So by you taking some steps to prepare your home and your family, uh, those few days, those few days are a lot more comfortable for you. Uh -huh. uh, there's a potential by doing taking a few extra steps for you to disaster-proof your home. Uh -huh. So the, the uh, damage effects may be less severe that okay. you would experience. Um, and there, there is a cost element, obviously, to this. Uh -huh. um, in our uh, on our web page, in our uh, family home preparedness guide. Okay. There is a calendar uh, that takes preparedness actions, things you might have to buy, things you might do, mm -hmm. information you may seek out, spreads that out over a six month period. So you're spreading out some cost. By the end of the six months you've got uh, the information you need and you've got an effective emergency supply kit. And that's the family preparedness guide available on your website. Right. That's a very good resource to our uh, viewers and, and other residents of our county. It's a great resource. I was thinking as you were talking there that we talked about the you hit the big things, you know, the nuclear events, the terrorist events, and so forth, and and those really seem overwhelming. Like there's no way I could prepare for that, and if that happens, then you know, forget it. It's just you know, zombie apocalypse kind of thing. Uh, but those events, while high risk and and remote, um, also lead to preparedness for other types of emergencies that we're more likely to face. Exactly. What uh, kinds it, of emergencies would residents of Wayne County be likely to face? Well, other than this winter, apparently, winter, <laughs> winter storms. Uh, we're not done with winter yet, so keep that in your back pocket. Um, we have seen some detrimental effects from storms in the past that delay travel and delay schools from opening and uh, businesses uh, forced to close down and those kind of things. Having plans for those, having uh, emergency supplies for those may also prepare you for flooding, may also prepare you for an earthquake. But some basic things to, to keep your family together, uh, to keep you comfortable, to keep you fed and uh, have some, uh, some water, something to drink, as well as plans for pets, plans for children, mm -hmm. uh, plans for special needs. My wife just had uh, hip replacement surgery. Okay. Um, the, the plan in our house has had to shift because of that, dis that short-term disability. Right. Uh, so looking at those kind of things and thinking through, well, how will I get her out of the house if need be? Uh, what are our transportation assets? What is she going to do if this happens while I'm at work and mm -hmm. otherwise dedicated or otherwise directed? Uh, those are some things we, we've had to factor in. And those kind of things happen to families routinely. Mm -hmm. uh, so you might be prepared today, but maybe a circumstance changes the way you need to prepare or need to think through some different things. You just mentioned the winter storms and the mild winter that we've had this year, but we are coming into spring. In fact, while this is airing, we'll be celebrating the vernal equinox. And with spring in Indiana, we often think of severe weather storms, uh, electrical storms, and even tornadoes, Right. wind events. Uh, what kind of preparedness should we do for that? I mean, is it more than just uh, knowing how to stay out of uh, harm's way? Well, uh, that, that is critical. The biggest thing with, uh, with convective storms that occur in spring and summer is ha having an information source, a reliable information source. What does um, that mean? Well, weather radio is, is a good ticket there to keep you informed immediately. You're getting information directly from the National Weather Service as soon as that information is released. But our local radio stations, our TV stations are very good about passing that information along as well. Uh, so a reliable source of information because these come up quickly. 
um, and you've got to respond quickly in order to protect yourself and take effective action. So an information source, that's, that's part of your overall preparedness anyway, is to stay informed. Um, and then your basic emergency supplies that you put together for the winter storm or the flooding events will be uh, there should you need them for a tornado strike as well. Um, we're talking about some common things that you know you're going to need in emergencies. Lighting, um, heat, ability to heat uh, or, or keep warm or mm -hmm. keep cool <laughs> depending okay. on the circumstance. Uh, some clothing, some water, some food that doesn't require heating uh, in order to prepare um, and the things to keep you comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, again, our, our situations change and um, it, your emergency kit, emergency supplies are, need to be specifically directed towards your needs. So if you require specific medications, um, that needs to be considered in your kit. If you have uh, small children, pets, those, those need to be considered in your kit as well and in your plans. Okay. We're running out of time on this segment of this show, but you mentioned emergency radios. What's a good emergency radio to get and why is that necessarily better than listening to the local radio station? Again, with a with a all hazards uh, weather alert radio, uh, that can be set up to only get the alerts that you're interested in for a basic geographic area. Those are issued by typically by county level. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to hear the things that's going on in Henry County, or you do, mm -hmm. you can program the radio to receive those emergency alerts. Uh, again, it's broadcast directly from the National Weather Service, so you're getting it as soon as well, you're on the front line of of the distribution on that. So you're getting it, the information immediately. Um, as far as brand, there are many, many uh, brands out there that do a good job um, available at Radio Shack or almost anybody that sells electronics. Kroger typically has a deal uh, where you can pick up a uh, weather radio at Kroger. I think it's near the service desk and they donate some of those proceeds from that sale to the American Red Cross. So it's a way to help the, really a broad segment of the community by you staying informed. Okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about now as we come up to the close of our segment that might interest our viewers about what's going on with the Emergency Management Agency in Wayne County right now? Well, we talked about uh, severe weather coming up. Mm -hmm. um, severe Weather Preparedness Week will be March 18th through the 24th. Okay. Again, this is a great opportunity. There'll be a lot of information available on severe weather and severe storms and how to prepare and what your needs might be. Mm -hmm. uh, information about uh, how to get a weather radio, for example. We'll be pushing out a lot of information through our email and Twitter distribution list. Uh, the statewide tornado drill, which is an opportunity for us as well as the community to test their communications and alert procedures will be March 21st. Those are typically at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, we'll pass more information about that along, but again, an opportunity to practice your uh, tornado preparedness plan. And our severe weather spotters training is scheduled for Wednesday, April 4th, uh, 6.30 to 9 p.m. at the County Administration Building. Uh, great opportunity to come out and find out more about severe weather. If you're interested in weather at all, mm -hmm. uh, this is presented by the National Weather Service, people that know about weather. Um, so it's, it's a, I've been to 20, over 20 of these mm -hmm. over the years, and I always learn something new. Which is always so, good. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good presentation, very interesting. Uh, it's great for folks who want to might think they're interested in reporting severe weather, but if you're just a weather enthusiast or want to know more about convective storms, this would be a t good ticket. All right. And it's free. And it's free. It's free. All right. Well, Fred, I really appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing all that information with us. And thank you for watching. Fred, I'd like to encourage you again to visit their website and also to visit our website, wingnet.org slash cc. Pay attention in the third week of March, the National Severe Weather Preparedness Week and the events that Wayne County Emergency Management Agency will be hosting then and also the Storm Spotter Training on April 4th or the Severe Weather Training on April 4th. Again, Fred, thanks for coming. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Michael. And welcome back. Again, thank you for watching Wayne County Connection on WGTV. And with us now is Scott Gregory, the Chief of Perry Township Volunteer Fire Department. Scott, welcome to the show. Hi, Michael. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Scott, you're a volunteer fireman mm -hmm. and volunteer firefighter, and you have been for 13 years. But tell us a little bit more about how you got involved with firefighting and uh, what it means to be a volunteer firefighter. Well, I got started uh, in the latter part of 1999 
uh, much like most people do, mm -hmm. uh, someone in the community um, who I knew was a volunteer firefighter in the organization, and they were out conducting a fundraising drive. And they were going door to door, and at that time they did a community birthday calendar. And they were looking for us to buy calendars and uh, solicit uh, uh, my family's names and dates and stuff on the calendar and, uh, in exchange for that if we wanted to do advertising, th things of that nature. And lots of members of the community did that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really knew, uh, the bug bit me, I guess, back in the early 80s. My uh, uncle mm -hmm. was the fire chief in Hollinsburg, Ohio, for years. And, uh, and that's when the bug first bit me. My first subscription to Firehouse Magazine started in the early 80s and continued <laughs> up through the 90s. Uh, but I just was not in a place where um, I felt like I was ready to fit into that volunteer spectrum yet. Mm -hmm. And that when they came to the door uh, and were soliciting donations for that, I said, "Are you? do you need any members? And they were like, yeah, we're taking applications all the time. And, and I, I'll never forget it. The first thing I did was ask, look, if I become a member, can I drive the truck? <laughs> uh, every young boy's dream, I think, yep. to drive the fire truck. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, something about a 20-ton piece of equipment that's big and red and... It makes a lot of noises. Yeah, in my world, they're all red, but <laughs> they build them in all different kinds of colors today, so... Sure. We talked about in the first segment of the show emergency preparedness mm -hmm. and volunteer firefighters uh, kind of are on the front line of emergency preparedness as far as a, a civilian or non-professional uh, emergency personnel. Volunteer firefighters though are, are kind of an odd bunch I, I guess maybe um, people who choose to for a, a non-professional event put themselves in harm's way to protect their neighbors. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Um, the latest statistics show that there are 1,103,300 firefighters uh, across the United States, and some 785,000 of those are volunteers in one way, shape, or another. So more than 70% of the 70. firefighters in the U.S. Mm -hmm. are volunteers. Yes, sir, in one way, shape, or form. Now, there are a variety of characterizations uh, there are what what we refer to in the industry as paid professionals, and then there are combination departments that may have both paid professionals and volunteers. Uh, there are combination departments that uh, are volunteers that pay their membership based on the number of runs, their certifications, things of that nature. Uh, and then there are uh, all just straight out volunteer departments like mine in uh, Perry Township. Okay. Is there much overlap between professional fire departments? We think of like the city fire departments in the mm -hmm. area and so forth, and the volunteers in the same area? There are, uh, across Wayne County, 12, well, 13 fire departments if you count the city of Richmond. Uh, but just about every volunteer department, mm -hmm. uh, the biggest percentage of them within the county has a, as a firefighter, that is a member of the Richmond Fire Department, mm -hmm. uh, paid professional on their staff. I have uh, I have one uh, in my department, uh, the town of Hagerstown and Jefferson Township Volunteer Fire Department. They have uh, three, two mm -hmm. guys from Newcastle and one from Richmond Fire. And then we, uh, what's interesting is that while you used the term odd bunch. Um, I, I don't, no misnomers there, not looking for a bad connotation or characterization, but uh, if you look at volunteer firefighters, they represent the an, a wide spectrum of capabilities and uh, perspectives, uh, and they're all looking for one thing, and that is to give something back for to their community. Mm -hmm. Some of the younger folks, as, as you come out of the department, are looking for that adrenaline rush. Some are looking to develop their skills uh, to become perhaps a paid professional in another jurisdiction, be it the city of Richmond, or the city of Muncie, or Anderson, or mm -hmm. Indianapolis, or something like that where the, where the full-time firefighters are paid uh, for their skills and their knowledge. Um, but if you look at the 17 members of my department mm -hmm. alone, um, I have um, two degreed engineers. I have a registered nurse and a National Register EMT paramedic who is also a care flight 
medic, mm -hmm. flies with CareFlight out of Miami Valley Hospital. I have a controller for a manufacturing facility uh, in Dunkirk, Ohio. I have two bankers and half a dozen small business owners. No insurance salesman? Uh, no insurance salesman. No insurance salesman at all. I was just was thinking about an overlap. You know, they'd want to reduce the risk, so they go out and <laughs> make sure that the fire structures don't burn down. <laughs> so, it, given that information, I mean, you, the, you can see that there's a, that's just one group of people. I sure. mean, I could have went through the whole list. And, right. Uh, these are these are people that farm and people that drive school buses, mm -hmm. um, people that own their own business, uh, people that. Uh, uh, have a small business close to the fire department that have always been a part of the fire department mm -hmm. for years and uh, they're looking to give something back to their community. When when the alert tone goes off on their pager that they wear on their hip, um, it's somebody that they know. Sure. Uh, and, and especially in, in our case when the tone goes off they're looking for whose name is it. Not necessarily address, but they right. know people that have lived in the community for three, four decades. Sure. Um, and they, they know people by name and mm -hmm. by handshake and by face and, and they don't know by their address. So there's a, I would imagine there's a little bit more investment too uh, from the volunteer fire departments to protect their neighbors. Um, not that saying that professionals don't have that same commitment, but volunteers really, you don't, they're not in it for the money, obviously. So they're in it for, as you say, the desire to help mm -hmm. and to be there for their community and to give back to their community. Sure. Um, I remember a couple of years ago Duracell was doing a big campaign for volunteer fire departments and um, you buy Duracell batteries and they gave something to volunteer fire departments and so forth and one of the ads I remember there was a, um, a youngish looking girl who said that the reason she became a volunteer fire fighter was to give back to her community because she felt like that was one thing that she could do to support her neighbors. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a recurring theme as you're talking about the members of your department and other mm -hmm. volunteer firefighters that you know. Yeah, it's all, uh, to me and, and to the most of the membership in my department uh, and, and thousands of other volunteer fire departments across the country, it's about, it's about giving back to your neighbor. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about being there when your neighbor has a problem and the closest medical service is 10 miles away. Mm -hmm or the closest um, professional organization is 15 miles away. Uh, so in order to, uh, you know, dovetail into what Fred talked about in the earlier segment, it's all about preparedness. Right. And our ability to prepare for those instances when our neighbors need us may set us above the average citizen. Mm -hmm. um, what we do takes uh, countless numbers, uh, countless hours of training, um, countless hours of devotion and commitment to what we do and why we do it. Uh, and, it and today, more than any other time in history, it's all about change. Mm -hmm. um, our customers, uh, I call them customers because everybody in Perry Township is a customer. Okay. Uh, and they expect a level of service, much mm -hmm. as do you do where you live. Mm -hmm. When you pick up the phone and dial 911, you expect somebody to come. Uh, and if that somebody is 15 or 20 miles away instead of four houses away, mm -hmm. your next phone call when you get out of the hospital or whatever your issue you're experiencing um, is to, hey, how come I can't get this service? I expect this service. Uh, and that, and that's, that's kind of where we are. Um, so in addition to being prepared for the emergencies that you might face, not only fires but other types of emergencies mm -hmm. as well, uh, one of the things that you're focused on is how to deliver that well to yes. everybody in the township. Uh, effectively is the word I use, effectively. And I like to, uh, not only my fire chief, but I'm also the president of the County Fire Association. Mm -hmm. uh, and I tell the members of the association all the time that we need to find, uh, we need to bridge the gap between just being viewed as volunteers and becoming professional volunteers. So that when when that phone call's made, they get the same type of service from their volunteer fire department that they would if they were in a uh, professionally covered town or city. 
there are a whole lot of questions that I have raising right now about how that would work that we're not going to have time for sure. right now. So I'd like to encourage people, you told us off air that you'd be willing to accept additional questions if our viewers are interested sure. and give you a chance to uh, give your contact information. Uh, viewers can contact me at my email and it's uh, chief, C-H-I-E-F dot Gregory, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y at Comcast.net. I'd be glad to forward questions that they have about how they approach their local volunteer organizations to the appropriate fire chief in the county. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if they're looking at being involved but maybe not being a member of the fire department, there are ways they can do that. There are community emergency response teams uh, uh, that are developed and trained by uh, Director Griffin and uh, Deputy Director Sharp down at the Wayne County Emergency Management Agency. Okay. So there are a myriad of ways that I can put them in touch with the right people. So in addition to being a volunteer firefighter, they could be a part of this emergency response team, mm -hmm. or they might just um, donate when they're asked when someone comes to the door knocking and, and asking them to contribute to a calendar. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, volunteer fire organizations today uh, are continued, just like the paid ones, uh, mm -hmm. are continued to be asked to do more with less. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, it costs more every day to do what we do do. Sure. So um, donations are always uh, at the forefront. Chili suppers, you know, we, we host two or three events a year just to generate revenue so that we can buy the things we need to provide those services that our customers expect. If there's one thing that you would like to tell our viewers about how they could interact with the volunteer firefighters, what would that be? Um, no one. No one. No one. Okay. And I'm spelling that K-N-O-W. <laughs> uh, no one. Okay. Uh, no one and ask questions. All right. it's, it's no different than becoming a member of any other service organization in the world, that, and there are lots of them. Mm -hmm. um, you start asking questions. Um, there, every firehouse in every community is well marked and well lit, and and somebody's there two or three nights a month. All right. Sometimes more than that. that. So, Chief Gregory, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you for the information that you've given our viewers about Perry Township and about volunteer firefighting in general. Thank appreciate you. you coming on the Thank show. Thank you, today. Michael. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Thanks. And again, thank you for watching Wayne County Connection. We've just been talking with Chief Scott Gregory of the Perry Township Volunteer Fire Department about volunteer firefighters and encourage you to learn more about them by contacting either him directly through his email address or contacting him through our website, waynet.org slash cc. I'd like to also thank Executive Director Fred Griffin from the Wayne County Emergency Agency for his time and the information that he shared with us today. Thank you for watching. Thank WayneNet.org and Executive Director Jane Holman and WGTV for broadcasting Wayne County Connection.